Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. It's really great to have all of these people in the room for this. Um, okay. Okay. I want to say some serious thank yous to those who have greatly supported the organization and implementation of this event. First, Arthur, thank you. I'm thanking you. Megan and Chris Bierman, and actually a lot of other Biermans came in in an angelic fashion this afternoon. Um, Stephen Motika, Bob Gluck, Jim, Ann, and Beth Fraser, Steve Dickinson, Hazel White, Vanessa Kaufman Zimmerly, Sebastian Klepke, and Una Lomax. Thank you all for all of your help and support. Um, and for the heavy lifting of listening to me kvetch, <laughs> big thanks to Norma Cole and Eleni Stakopoulos. Um, when the program ends, please join us in the reception room, which is on the whole other side of the museum. You can just follow the crowd. Um, and we'll have some food and drinks, visiting. Be sure to sign the guest book in there. Look through the tributes in the folder near it. And please turn off your cell phones. I want to thank Susan for putting this whole thing together. Um, and we're going to start uh, with a brief six minute clip of Kathleen Fraser's reading at um, the Poetry Center at San Francisco State in 1974. There's a brief introduction by Diane DePrima. And then at the end, uh, 10 poets will come up here with me and we'll read uh, Kathleen's 1995 poem. So without further ado, um, let's watch Kathy. Geniuses and things, and uh, so I used 
I used, um, I didn't, I certainly didn't have any idea of becoming a writer. Uh, that was far too way up in the sky for me to associate with myself, and it sort of began popping out out of desperation uh, when I was in college and studying other things that were appropriate. Um, I didn't have that lovely companionship of being with other writers. I did find myself down in the basement uh, in the newspaper office with all the weirdos, all the underground people at school, and feeling awkward with them, and yet knowing that was where I felt life. Um, and I guess it was at that point that I began to start scribbling. And uh, when I got to New then I sort of went to New York, not knowing a soul, but on a sheer nerve, as I think of it now, on uh, some sort of instinct that I would begin to connect with other people who cared about that, that journey. Um, so the, this first poem I'm going to read to you is um, about that, that identity, that wanting to change and wanting not to be held down by how others see you. And I didn't realize how angry a poem it was when I wrote it. It was one of, really, this is very early work, this first book that I'm reading from. I'll just uh, do a few to give you a sense of how I, how I travel. Um, this is called Change of the Dress. When the ring gleamed white at your chair of the edge of it, and I let an elephant into the tent with my skin like gold lame and black mesh snaking the length of my legs and hair of pomaded waves curling red to the waist. When I leaped to the back of the elephant, scaling his 5,000 wrinkles, yes, feeling his huge bones lurch and the canvas ripping up night near my neck and all the lights blazing. When I slid down his hairy trunk to lie flat in the sawdust under the five cloved foot, waiting with the old silk handkerchief over my face, did you think you were at a circus? Or the year I wore purple velvet and a torn wedding veil, with a little blue fan spread over my pale thighs and hovered near the ceiling pouring tea, and good omens were predicted when the oatmeal cookies were passed, and you cried out, the recipe, the recipe. And then, when I hitched a ride on that Spanish rooster, waving goodbye with one hand, the other holding tight to his blazing comb, and seven candles burned on the wedding canopy, did you think it was a painting you were looking at? You can tear your lecture notes now, erase every phone number under my name, and go shopping in someone else's suitcase. I've changed my address again. And don't waste your money on bilingual roadmaps. After a six-day ocean voyage, a train ride, and three metro transfers, you'd only find nights where the breath turns to snow after dark and a bench with a man making blankets of his arms, his wife in her black wool nightgown, and a three-legged cat in her lap. And then, would you recognize me? Uh, as I was choosing the poems that I wanted to read today, uh, I thought I would try to read poems. things I needed to know, usually willing to help me understand. From kindergarten through sixth grade, I walked to school with her. When I was five and saw a fuck written on a wall, she explained it had to do with some sort of perverse going to the bathroom. <laughs> Where I was confused, 
She had been there just long enough ago to remember clearly while gaining perspective. When I was in seventh grade, she came home loving geometry and helped me see its beauty. When she first had a lover, she shared it with me in a loving way. When I hitchhiked to New York, I crashed on her floor. We were proud of each other. Though we lived, though we lived far apart the last 50 years, she somehow continued to play the role of my main mentor internally, much more than I had realized until she was gone. She left a huge gap whose size I would never have predicted. I'm going to read a piece of hers. Child inside of air and light, not speaking. We were in, uh, this is autobiographical piece, we were in a little town, Postville, Iowa. My dad had just gotten his first <coughs> church, he's a minister, and we were living in our first family house. And Kathleen got sick as a five-year-old. I do not think how it looked, my room before this one, except that it was upstairs and big enough for everything. This one belonged to a grown-up and is outside my skin, which keeps being hot. This room is tall with lots of air around me, stretching to all four walls, like the outside coming in through the window. Out there it is snowing. They keep saying that's why the air is so white. That's why I can't breathe. I think it's because all the leaves fell off the trees and there was no place to stop the light. There isn't any nest left for the light. I try to remember the color of branches without leaves, but I can't think in pictures now. I only see big walls and heat running up them. They pat me up and sit me at the end of the bed every morning against a pile of white pillows that gets crumpled with sweat. At night I get lost somewhere outside in the snow, or I forget when it is night and when it is day because I don't do anything but look out at the room which is now my house and there is no other place except outside the door where everyone else lives or behind the curtain that keep closed so my eyes won't hurt. The doctor lives behind the curtain and so does my father and so does my brother, but not my doll and not my books which seem not to be here now. There's a big stack of folded white diapers belonging to my brother on the nightstand next to the island where I live. They're for blowing my nose on instead of handkerchiefs. The nightstand floats around in the water and if I run out of space on one diaper then I call out for another one and she comes in and unfolds a fresh one and hands it to me. I like it when it is new and clean. I hold it to my cheek and call it my tablecloth. Once when they thought I was getting better, it was because I called it my flag, and then my curtain. The larger ones last longer than the little pieces of cloth with flowers on them. Every week I have been sitting here for a day as long as a year, except when I keep coughing and someone rushes in, or when my father comes home for lunch smelling of his wool coat and the coldness on his skin. He gives me my medicine in a kind of wool pill, which he presses down until it is white powder in a teaspoon of maple syrup. I try to remember the other rooms in the house and what they do out there, drinking coffee, singing radio, ironing, my brother crying out from his crib. She brings me a bowl of something on a tray that smells rotten, and I know a bad thing will happen if I put it in my mouth. My new bed, my house, is wide and long, I shouldn't spill anything on the spread. Sometimes it stretches like a park or a sidewalk, or there are bells and a glass of water. This morning I was almost getting better. I was almost getting bigger than my upstairs bed, but this one doesn't have ends close enough to reach my hands. She comes in and looks at me when she thinks I'm sleeping. She comes in between doing other tasks, and I listen to her footsteps between rooms and voices from her radio programs. She's in the back part of the house now. She's in the kitchen cooking something I don't like. She brings in a glass with stuff sloshing around near the top and says it is good. It's called pablum, which is not a good word. But I look at it in the glass anyway for just a minute, and 
and just gray and mixed with little gritty bits of sand floating in it instead of being in a bowl like my brother eats from. I remember that its name is the name of cereal for babies. It smells like dust or nothing you would want to eat. As if you didn't know the difference. Have some, she says, will help you get better. I tell her I don't want any, but she walks out of the room and leaves the glass right there with its smell and says I should drink it while she's gone, like a big girl. It's full of baby cereal with lukewarm milk. I cannot think in the big air of the room. I want to push the glass away. I keep turning my head to watch it and then look to see if she is coming after she goes out the door. I feel my mind pressing inside me to yell out. I want to get out of bed more than just when she changes the sheets while I sit in a straight chair with a blanket over me. And she gives me fresh pajamas and takes my temperature. I don't know where all the runny stuff I blow out of my nose comes from. I try to make it stop, but I don't know where to close it off. I want to draw a picture of the inside of me to make me get better, and I tell my father when he comes in to say goodbye. She's on the telephone when he goes back to his office. I look at the pablum glass, and I do not feel tired, except for having nothing to think about. I can hear her voice on the telephone explaining to Francine Buchanan's mother how I'm doing. Her voice is worried when she tells Mrs. Buchanan my symptoms, and her voice sounds the same way it did when my father had to go to Chicago to have his medical checkup for the war. <laughs> That day I asked her what was wrong, but she looked away and said I was too young to understand, and she just kept crying and blowing her nose into a very big piece of cloth like a pillowcase. I thought about it a long time after that. I thought about what I understood. I was thinking about it when I knocked the glass of pablum off the nightstand. <laughs> I was thinking about it, what it would look like falling through the air if I pushed it. I am watching it tip over, and then the stuff in it is pouring out like gray, wet snow, and the glass is breaking into sharp pieces on the floor. I am ready to tell her a lie. I am thinking of my reason. <laughs> <laughs> Is this all right? Uh, I'm not going to rebound here. When I really thought about it, uh, I couldn't do it. Kathleen's voice is so wonderful, and it's in my ear. And I just, but I was looking at the correspondence that we had, and many people did because she was away so much. Uh, I was surprised by the number of letters I have from her, and I decided to share some sections with you to hear the freshness of Kathleen's voice, how young her spirit was, how she encountered the world as though for the first time, her intimacy wedded to abstraction, the precision of her choices, and her longing for connection. So I'm just going to jump around. 1981. We looked out the window this morning to see it snowing once again. It seemed a reasonable event because it had been so cold here in February when we arrived. As it turned out, the softly, widely spaced snowflakes were the very light-winged seeds spewing forth from the chestnut pods, which had all broken open this very morning and were spreading their billion progeny upon the rooftops and in the gutters of Rome. 2000. While some guests doze after lunch, or watch the Pope, or <laughs> ongoing soccer tournaments on TV, or talk the endless talk, I will wander out to the dock that abuts their very long stretch of grass and trees, and sit under my straw hat, watching the glint of water and the little boats no motors allowed, but scatterings of canoes and kayaks and sailboats with fabulously colored spinnakers. 
and a few paddle boats to keep the children busy. If a boat comes along with someone I know in it, I may, I may get in. I have been doing this ver some version of this in this very wonderful spot every Easter since 1986. It seems suddenly today warm enough to go swimming, which I love to do in this vast lake because it is formed in the crater of a volcano and thus very clean. And I feel safer swimming in a lake than the ocean in spite of the fact that this one is essentially bottomless. 1981. This is about Lita and Swan. Power, power, power. Master slave, exhausting to see it up close in this particular context and try to write about it in some fresh way beyond one's self-indulgence. Still I try. It's not good yet, but here and there I hit something true. 2002. Dear Babo, which was her name for me, <laughs> I hope you are poised with your umbrella, one foot in front of the other, as you traverse the uncertain spaces on your tightrope. 2003. Along the way, stumbled upon a Benedictine convent with a cloister and living space for 12 dried up nuns. Its doors open to the public and hung with ancient red fabric on this one day of the year. Rooms upon rooms, up and down staircases filled with treasures. Nicest part, the cloister filled with lemon trees, also some lovely devils with red tongues and flames coming out of their ears, chasing the nuns around the interior walls of the anteroom leading up to their holiest holy of chapels, the Tsar. <laughs> so I enter each day as if it were normal, but taking nothing for granted. I chug along to Pilates, yoga class, massage, long walks, lemon juice and warm water, <laughs> vitamins, wondering why I am here instead of home. One tries to think of where one might be safe and protect one's family, and there is no longer an answer if there ever was one. 1988. Now I'm going to tell you as briefly as possible what went on intercontinentally, but I must have your absolute promise you will not say a word to anyone about any of the things I'm telling you. <laughs> 2004. Monday, we were walking all over Trastevere and ended up in the Piazza San Casimato late in the morning. It was Paschetta, day after Easter, and very overcast, and no one knew what to do with themselves because it had poured rain in the a.m. So people couldn't go out for picnics with their leftover hard-boiled eggs and salami ends. <laughs> and it was actually mildly pleasant with the children ramming around the fountain on their kids' bikes. And then I saw our friends, Emanuela and Lolly and Richard, and they seemed so happy to see us that I felt a flood of Pasqueta affection crawl through my frozen orange juice veins, as if it would allow, as if it would all be so easy. If only I could let myself jump onto my bicycle and ride around the piazza. <laughs> 1992. The whole experience of having children is so utterly enormous that one can only begin to speak of it in increments as it's happening. That's why new parents tend to hover together to give each other support through the multiple levels of terror, elation, and unknowing. Such guesswork would put Fred Astaire's footwork to shame. 2005. I wanted you to know, since we had talked of this, 
but please don't tell anyone. <laughs> As I want to do this privately and see what happens before the gossip is on the street. 2010. <laughs> I asked her, I bought a jacket that I adored in Rome uh, 10 years earlier, and I asked her to go back to the same shop to see if she could get me a replacement. <laughs> Dearest Bobo, keeper of the flame and voice of eternal expectation, rising towards the potential repeat performance of the perfect fawn-colored jacket <laughs> once glimpsed in 2000 in a particularly <laughs> understated and very chic window of a men's clothing store on the Via del, della Carrozze. Believing in its platonic existence and its material <laughs> manifestation, even in tawdry hustle-bustle Rome, and in fact believing that the last fawn-colored co corduroy jacket in just your size was holding its breath quietly in the back of a closet <laughs> on the Via della Carrozze, sort of dreaming that a guy about your age and size, <laughs> hopefully with an American with romantic and calmly attentive eyes, would walk into this store and claim it and pay the same price he paid <laughs> 10 years earlier. <laughs> Certainly this must be the ultimate version of being in good faith. And for this I celebrate you. So it makes me even sadder than I might have been to tell you that the manager, Il Comesso, who stood ready to serve when I entered the sh his shop, just looked into my eyes, which were at that moment your blue hopeful eyes, <laughs> with mildly affectionate pity. <laughs> As I described what I'd come for, your original purchase and how much you'd love the jacket, its pocket flaps, it's 45.7 centimeters from armpit to the very end of the sleeve. <laughs> and said with something sliding between woefulness and disbelief. But ma'am, that was 10 years ago. The fabric does not exist now. The pockets went to a pair of pants in Perugia. And the fawn returned to nature. <laughs> a thin sigh seemed to circle him. I'm sorry, but such is life. His formerly active eyebrows arranged themselves in one flat line above his brown eyes. He called out, Madam, what a good man. What loyalty. Maybe next time he comes to Rome, he'll return to my shop and find another moment of perfection. <laughs> 1992. She's bawling me out. She says, you're sort of, oh, guess what, Kathleen? Slight smile. Barrett Watton asked if he could write all the titles of my books on his birthday cake. <laughs> uh, I know. Okay, 1984. This is from a thank you note for Kathleen and Art's wedding reception that we had in my house. The food felt good about itself, and we all agreed and admired it profusely, trying to contain our ravenous appreciations by approaching Mount Chicken Liver with proper respect. <laughs> when that broke down, it was no one's fault. Finally, the divine demands its own levels of excess, and that's when new categories are invented. And this is the last, 1984, on December 25th. <clears throat> dear Bob, dear friend, we've survived another year, and yes, we've grown, and oh, it was difficult, and maybe the struggle is all, and if not, what? Inch by inch, I salute you. Love, Kathleen. Thank you. Delighted to read for uh, Cynthia Hugg, who wrote a really 
beautiful piece for Kathleen. The line, not Cynthia. Folk. Um, I thought for this very tender tribute to share a small bit of the wealth of Kathleen's marvelous letters and an unpublished fragment with you. Kathleen was such a generous spirit, and she dowered us richly in so many ways, including not only her published works, but also in her private musings, as in her correspondence. So what follows is mostly Kathleen in her own words. Quote, I sometimes wonder, she, mu she mused in an email dated 2006, about often being so located in things. Williams, yes, but often seems to me finally a mind preoccupied with the huge political philosophical, philosophical questions of the 20th century, but held in tension by a spiritual force that dominates his sense of history. His materialism, thingness, is in the substance, weight, measure of each word, rather than each red wagon. And the space of the page in which it is laid is carefully as a brick in a very strategic wall. End of quote. I reread this paragraph as I go through my correspondence from Kathleen over two decades and think this is an apt description of something so central to her poetry. Although, of course, Kathleen's material feminism undermines questions and even explodes that strategic wall. As she explained movingly in interview notes to me in 1997, quote, I dreamed that I began scratching with my red and black ink and all the marks were fragmentary. The dream was about collaboration, about assembling evidence, presence, literal, psychic, and historic. My work, and about using my own pen, a theme of mine for a very long time, finding my own pen to do my work, in order, I think, to embody a self, in order to discover that there is an evolving being, a living, changing, breathing in there. On June 30th, 2003, Kathleen emailed from Paris where she and her beloved husband, Arthur, were to celebrate their anniversary. As Kathleen wrote jauntily, married 19 years today, plus 10 years of courting, not bad, <laughs> in this fragment of poetic musing. Email in Paris, chestnuts in blossom, allergy pollen under the trees. Email in Paris, this is a feeling no one can ever retrieve. Brief and telling lines tracked that lived, cherished moment now memorialized of the evolving, thoughtful, jo joyous woman whose radiant beingness, living, changing, breathing in there, touched our lives so deeply that she changed them. To close, this from the first part of Notebook 3 in the AD Notebooks, and I'll just read this poem. Notebook 3, Taking Away. She must be mother light, traded in, for lover light, God in Chicago light. Let there, let there be word, food, red, and God. Every Sunday, borrowing him back, noon's chicken, over them, noodles too, and finally alone, lead kindly light, I could draw a line with my crayon, but the other lines are swallowing it. Then a little humming, and some pop sound pulls sideways, and I'm gone. So, uh, thanks everyone for coming so much. I'm David, Kathleen's son, and uh, I'm just going to speak very briefly, and then uh, our dear old friend John Marin will have a few things to say and maybe read something. Um, 
I mostly wanted to talk about what I'll miss most about Kathleen um, and uh, remembering her uh, at her best. The last few months of her life were very hard. Uh, she'd been having memory problems for a while, but uh, it was mostly fine up until the, the near the end. Um, I remember uh, sitting next to her while she was in bed, and she pointed to a, a CD player, which she didn't recognize. Um, but then I realized most people in their 20s don't know what a CD player looks like either, so <laughs> that seemed fine. Um, but probably what I miss most about Kathleen is sharing things with her. Um, a TV show I thought she would love, a, a, a good book, a new movie, uh, something that someone had said, um, a, a, an idea or a, a recipe, um, a, a old memories, uh, and just kind of uh, sharing those things and exchanging those things with her just in a very normal way. I, I think it was uh, when we were best as, as son and mother. Um, just the, the daily and weekly sharing, just human exchanges of little things, little bits of information that I knew that she would love or that would just connect us, even if it wasn't something that she would love. And also just to say what a great mom she was. Uh, really couldn't have had a better mother. Growing up in those times in San Francisco in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> so here's John Marin, uh, who Kathleen met in Portland in, uh, I guess, about 71. 74. So, uh, I, I think before that, because, yeah, before that, because yeah. we were here in 74. Oh, that's we, right. we, yeah, so it must have been much earlier. No, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So I gather she would say non che de pu in her last moments, like right up to the end, correct? Which means don't go, right? Mm -hmm. So this, 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 this is more of like a direct letter. Kathleen, I mean, Bob's letters are just incredible. Kathleen's letters were gifts from God. And so this is really almost like a letter to her wherever she was. When I heard immediately. So, for Kathleen, David, and Art. <sighs> mm. 
non c'è di più. Don't go. Don't go. But in deed and thought and body, as with all of us, please stay. But as with all of us, we must pass over. The rivers and mountains beckon. Kathleen, I love you so much. You gave me heart, mind, soul, things I could never give myself. Beyond the mystic, the bardo, the various promises of sacred text and cryogenic modern medicine, may we meet again somehow. Every chamber of my heart, brain, gut, soul, every breath I have left, you will be there for the duration. In your kitchen with art, David, making me pasta carbonara, clams casino, Arturo mixing up a dry martini, cracking wise in your Roman apron and looking out over Quake Tower to the East Bay and the Golden Gate sun fading away, glints and honks of Miles Davis in the background, grainy North Beach traffic, mauve soft green midnight blue in the Berkeley Hills, Emeryville even, <laughs> from Tulsa, Oklahoma, even. Wow! The mountains of language you've climbed. Wow! The UC San Diego paper legacy you have left us so carefully down here below. Wow! The wilderness paths you've opened for so many women of the pen. And take good care wherever your spirit chooses to rest. Thank you so much for this. Thank about friendship and Levinas's idea of exorbitant hospitality, unconditional reception based on the phenomenological experience of the other. This is how it was with Kathleen. Exorbitant hospitality. She had a vast capacity for it, attentive listening, ferocity on behalf of the other, ideas to solve a problem flying. So many of us in this room have been the recipients of this. Sitting across the table from Kathleen, an infinity sign circulates between us, dipping into our chests as it moves out again to enter the chest of the other. When we met, I was 27 and she was 47. A year after we met, she asked me to be an associate editor on However. I was brought from intuition about what was urgent into articulation of it and action for it. I was brought into conversation. While folding, however, for a mailing, I listened to Kathleen and Beverly Dolan, Francis Jaffer, and sometimes Carolyn Burke and Rachel Blau du Plessis agree and disagree about what counts as feminist poetics how it's evident in this or that work. I learned to argue for the inclusion or not of work sent to us for publication. I first encountered the work of so many of you in this room. I drank it all up and learned so much because Kathleen brought me in, a young woman with so little experience of poetry or anything, exorbitant generosity, and that was only the beginning. I've been thinking about how friendship 
does not have a civil designation, as do family or spouseship. There are usually no vows exchanged, and it can endure long absence and silence. In the case of close women friends, it is often the infrastructure that holds up so much else in a life. It was that for me and Kathleen. Recently, a close woman friend from college said, maybe it takes as long to understand a relationship as it does to have it. That might begin to explain why, in addition to the obvious grief, I am also bewildered by Kathleen's absence. So many departures and reunions between us over those 35 years. Her body rocking to the rhythm of her own work as I read it aloud to her last month, and she became a prone leer. Again, the chest emptied out at last sight, and yet here she is again in a letter to me from Etruscan Pages. I vividly remember this moment as she disappeared through my cab window. I'm going to excerpt a little bit here, and um, thanks for forgiving my Italian pronunciation. 14th June, 1991. Dear Susan, an isolated fact cut loose from the universe has no significance for the poet. It derives its significance from the reality to which it belongs. Wallace Stevens on Poetic Truth. The night after you left for Paros, I dreamt I was lying on a stone slab at the base of the cliff tombs at Norcia, preparing to make my transition from this world to the other. I was thinking about how to negotiate the passage when it came to me, the reason for all the layers of fine white cloth arranged and spread around me. I said to you, because you were with me, you just keep wrapping yourself with white cloth, and eventually you are in the other place. I wanted to write about the trip, but I couldn't find words for those places at once so peaceful and full of what was and wasn't there. Two nights later, I dreamt again of Norcia. This time, Norma had come there to work on engravings. She asked me if I'd work on them with her. I began assembling evidence after that, scratching with my red and black ink down the pages of the new ledger you'd given me, all fragmentary. Today, exactly a week since your face went by inside the window of the cab, a classical archaeologist phoned up to have a look at our place. He'd seen our rental announcement. He knew Norcia and the cliff tombs, and we talked about the mystery surrounding the Etruscan language. We still have no idea beyond family names and lineage, or sometimes an inscription to a particular god or goddess. One doesn't have much to go on with tombs as your main reference. Then he recalled several other sources under study. Two plates, rectangles of fine beaten gold covered with text, found in the temples of Pigra, near, very near where we were, but closer to the sea. I saw the places at the um, Villa Gialli, Gialia in Rome on Saturday. The other source is the mummy wrapping, linen originally from Egypt, probably hauled on trading ships, and covered with formulaic and repetition Etruscan religious precepts. When they found her in Etruria, her body had been wrapped in this shroud made of pieces of linen written on through centuries, used as pages for new writing whenever the old text had faded. Her family had wrapped her in this cloth, this writing, because it was available. With dreamed stylus in wakeful hand and many empty pages, I send you love, imagining you half in, half out of the water.
his horn. He was always looking for something more than himself around the next corner. And the other guys followed close behind. He had his back up. There was a kind of reverence in that room. By the time he was into his second set, people, if they needed to talk, kept it brief and low. The waitress worked by sign language. The bartender knew his place. I'm not a religious person, but sitting through those nights was as close as I've come to what church is supposed to be. As near to leaving my body as anything I'd ever felt. One night, I imagined I could hear Mr. Coltrane sinking into the, sinking into the air, and it occurred to me that songs could be like old alphabets, going back and back, and someone with a horn and his own way of thinking in sound could cut an old song out of the air like a new typeface, finding its inner balance just at the place where a horn player feels something pulling and suddenly changes keys. sister. Uh, I just have a very short memory to share from the day before she died. And she hadn't been talking much. She was very tired and uh, sleeping a lot because of medication. But I, I came to her in the morning and there had been a incredible sunrise. So I was telling her about the sunrise and the, the layers of gold and yellow and, and then the darker uh, red and you know and I went on for a while and she was very attentive and then she reached up her arm. She wasn't moving a lot then. She reached up her arm. She said, I want some of yours. <laughs> and I said, oh, sweetheart, you're welcome to it. And then she had this wonderful smile on her face that was very familiar and smiled with kind of satisfaction and lay back down. When uh, for, I was first asked to read from Kathleen's works for this memorial, I felt tremendously honored, and I can only say how honored I am to be here amidst all of you and to be here to read Kathleen's words. Kathleen was simply one of the most, if not the most important person outside my family in my life. People have said that she changed them, she changed me. Um, she changed me because she had faith and belief in me at 
at a time when perhaps that was fairly thin in myself. She listened. She was generous. She was a magnificent spirit for which uh, we are all at a loss that she is gone. So I thought of what I would like to read, and there were so many different stages of her work that I wanted to read from and had to choose one. Uh, I wanted to begin by saying that I first met Kathleen by reading her poetry. I read it in the late 1970s, her book, New Shoes, and for me it was an open door. As a woman poet, she wrote love and sex as good as a man. And that was hard to find in the late 1970s, and it was simply important for me that that kind of presence was there in poetry, and it was out of a voice of a woman poet. Uh, so her new shoes gave me that, and I read it quite diligently. Um, there are other wonderful works that I read. I didn't really meet Kathleen as a person until the year 2000, or just maybe a little bit before. So I was a reader of her work. So to get to know her and become a friend of hers, and I regard her as a very important mentor of me, because she read my poetry and my work so carefully. She was the first reader of my work, and I had gone through the equivalent of an MFA program, had friends in writing, etc., who read it as, in a way, making her very careful little pencil marks, in a way that helped me find the poetry I was trying to write. I, before, I did often seem like people was trying to correct it, and it was not quite what I was trying to do, and so suddenly there was this person in my life who was writing these little pencil marks, encouraging me to write, and helping me to find the particular way through that was so important for me. Um, so I'm going to read something very selfish. Kathleen taught me to be selfish. And the selfish thing I'm going to read is she and I did a residency together in the San Juan Islands at, near Seattle. And this is a very lovely, important place for me. I go there frequently. Uh, she came in 2008, and we both were sitting at our desks writing. <coughs> so I'm going to give you a couple of lines of us at our desks. These are Kathleen's words. It becomes more difficult to know where to start. Look at your own desk, okay? Tiny lamps shine back at us from early fishing boats, scooting over the sound's icy water. Now gearing forward, the boats clip trails of white left behind as they surge ahead. I'm going to conclude with the poem Black Suitcase and then end with a short email that she sent me shortly after the collaboration. Black Suitcase conjures the place so vividly for me that this is a kind of gift. To have someone go to a place that you care about a great deal and to write it in such a way that it comes back different but the very place that one loves is a gift. A black suitcase. Um, in it you'll see that there are deer. She calls them a doe, so that maybe will help with the hearing of the poetry. Black suitcase. Color arrives, green arrives, as a subset in collaboration. Sun having risen in place, Again, black suitcase pulled over bed of needles. The doe turns, glances up at intervals, leans, nibbles at early soaked grass, haunches markedly slanted inward. At 
knee joints intended for escape, though still seen through glass door, with smaller replica behind her, nibbling, glancing up. If I woke earlier, that is, if for any reason my eyes were prompted to open, it was not from a dream, but that someone's voice said, morning, as if from outside sleep. Not the mechanical command of alarm, but inviting me to reassemble and inhabit a body as it leaned across cotton sheets to see clock hands at 7.05 a.m. Some sort of brain scan, J at the door of sleep, not physical in the normal way one thinks of bodily presence, but as in the signal of a passenger ship approaching, you in unmeasured depth still sleeping, being the harbored one in the middle distance. So um, Kathleen and I also corresponded quite a lot, mainly through email, because by the time I knew her, email was pretty much the way that people communicated. And it uh, was fun for me because one could write and she would be right there. And then she, I would write back and because I was in Seattle when she was San Francisco, this gave me a sense of immediacy that would not have been possible without the electronic revolution. So she wrote me shortly after our collaboration, and I'm reading this for Arthur. Uh, this is, Arthur was not there at our collaboration. Arthur was home in San Francisco. But she wrote on 15th August, 2008, Hey Jay, just scrabbling out from chaos of return. Transition from extraordinary to ordinary, except for exceptional Arturo, who is most particular and divine to come home to. His loving ways, funny dance routines, spaghetti mongoli, and mad appreciation of me in my absent, absence. Well, that absence cliche is true. A loved the delicate moth I found on the floor of the big study room and brought to him in the envelope, as well as his retro silk neck scarf with its intricate fringe and the black and ivory Italian necktie. Friday Harbor Thrift Shop wins again.
Is that an intro? <laughs> I was Kathleen's husband. It was a privilege. I first met her in 1972. She came down to be head of the poetry center and read. The office was next door, and I often went in. She says, why are you coming in? I says, to admire your legs. But <laughs> 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 she appreciated it. <laughs> I said, oh, this is a, a woman I could live all my life with and hers. And I did. It was wonderful. In her last days, She was in another separate floor, and I would go down to visit her. And she was in great pain. Her last months were full of pain until she was in hospice. And she bore it very good. And I'd come in and I'd announce myself, hold her. And we exchanged little kisses, which she liked. And she said always, invariably, don't go. And I assure her that I would be there. And then on February 4th, I visit. It was a little different. There was a different tone. And of anxiety of her, don't go. And I looked at her, examined her face carefully, and I said to myself, my goodness, Kathleen's dying. And I asked the hospice nurse, he said, yes, she is dying. And so I crawled into bed beside her, I whispered in her ear that I understood that this was a different don't go because she didn't want to die alone. And I said, don't worry, Kathleen. I'll stay forever in a day. She seemed to be reassured. And I did. I got into bed beside her. And she had a strong, urgent pulse. Stronger than ever in her whole life that I felt. And then suddenly it stopped. And as Horatio said after Hamlet died in his arms, now cracks a noble heart. Lights of angels sing to thy breast. Well, I'm not an angel. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm suggesting what we do is read Kathleen to her rest. I know the word read may be a little prayer, but Somewhat similar to whale. We don't say it, but we leave it in our hearts. Goodbye, Kathleen. Goodbye. We grieve thee. Do thy rest.
thoughts that come today. And I want to suggest a strategy of helping stop grieving. Instead of thinking about the past and what we've lost, the greater the loss, the greater the grief. That's the irony of death. That we think about an aspect of Kathleen's work that has been neglected, except by Stephen Motika. Here's a, a booklet here called Dear Kathleen that was published by his press in which he wrote the introduction. And this contains the things that were said during an earlier celebration of the life of Kathleen Fraser, organized by Susan DeVertz and Stephen Motika as they organized this one today to memorialize her. And Here's the proceedings of the, the celebration. And on the cover, you know that um, what, I, what I want to say today to help you heal is that I want to remind you, as Stephen has urged us to do, that Kathleen was an exceptional theoretician of poetry. Her own theories produced her wonderful poetry. I want to explain to you why I think that's so. She, Kathleen, in my view, literally, was the major physicist of poetry. Her theory of poetry is, is a theory of physics, not the physics of Galileo, Newton, or Einstein, where the major force is gravity. But the new physics, where it's a universe of atoms and subatomic particles, and not the force of gravity, but the force of electromagnetic forces and how she used those to provide a theory of poetry. And I'm going to read a sentence from this book, Dear Kathleen, published by Stephen, Night Boat Books, <laughs> which you can find on the internet. And He picks out the perfect sentence. It's from translating books, her book, Translating the Unspeakable. Wonderful phrase. He dares you. And the page is Graphically, the page is an energetic sight. Which to manifest one's physical alignment with the arrival of a language in the mind. That's a tremendous sentence. And 
she was in very conscious and of the new physics and its new forces, new objects of electromagnetic energy. So her physics of poetry is a physics that fits into the new forces in the world for the new physics. concepts in thinking about poetry were the line and the page and their interaction with each other. And for her, a poem was a physical entity. It's what you see when you look at a book and there are marks on paper. That's physical. That's all there is to poetry in the terms of its ontology. Just those lines giving off their energy into your visual <coughs> component and the pain. <coughs> so the most the better her best collaborator with an artist was Hermine Ford. And this book has, dear Kathleen, has a picture of a, of a, a, bird, a bird from her painting that she was collaborating <coughs> on with when she, and Kathleen, when we, she was in the American Academy in Rome. She had a studio there, and Kathleen used to go over there almost every day. And they would talk on their collaborations. And Hermine tells me that many of their conversations were about electromagnetic energy. <laughs> so it's not a phrase she uses, it's something she used in talking about her collaborator together. And this is a, you can't see it of course, but this is a, a, a detail from the painting she was working on. And it's a picture of the head of a bird. It looks very irreverent. <laughs> Saucy. <laughs> and her line going with that one is but that sparking or keeps shedding music. She's not singing a song for him to say something fresh. She, the spirit is shedding music. And the spirit is so happy to be doing that. <laughs> So there's a beautiful example of how her collaborators and she work, they inspired each other. They were both physicists.
in Rome with you and Kathleen, where we met wonderful dinners and shared our work and argued and those were wonderful times. Right? And <laughs> I don't know what else to say. When um, the last time we were together, and um, Kathleen, maybe maybe they were her last poems. I think that she wrote in um, 2017, 2016. And the last time we had our little salon, Kathleen, Kathleen read this poem. This is an actual piece of paper that she held in her hand. After the dinner, I took the page, as we always took each other's work. And for some reason, I've kept this poem with me ever since. And I read it again this morning. And I, I don't know why, but it, it speaks about what Kathleen was going through in those last years. And, and I'll just read it. And I know you won't like the way I read it, but I'll try. I'll read it slowly. <coughs> it's a short poem. It's called A Rome Poem. It was written in May, on May 2nd, 2016. Why did it come to you? You needed it to talk to. A condensed sobriety. What is this simple, soluble word after word in your path? But what are you pulling up the stairs? Something inside the language of a body. One called it blood, another vessel. Its urgency to arrive with speedy dictation, oration of late light. Then open your word, heart. Let me in. The last email I received from Kathleen had the subject line, a quick question to be followed by more next week. The follow-up email never arrived. And even now, part of me is still waiting to find a new missive from dear Kathleen arriving in my inbox at 4 a.m. Her letters to me, many of them of an administrative editorial nature, always showed the various capacities of her mind at work, the succinct diction, her sly passion for metaphor, the rhythm of her phrases and lines. I love the way she used the plus symbol to link the parts of her message, the way she broke sections with lines, and then always her name in a different font, often one that was goofy or overly decorative. <laughs> she brought the gusto of letter writing with her into the digital age. In the last few years, her once robust missives began to dwindle, then ceased to arrive, first stuck in her drafts and then left unrecorded as fragments in her mind. On her last visit to New York in the spring of 2017, I gave her a copy of the tribute book, Dear Kathleen, which Susan Gewertz and I edited. The editing and production of the book was arduous, and I had been feeling guilty that the book was so delayed, having nightmares that it would be too late for Kathleen to read it and enjoy it. I handed it to her in New York, and she held it up, looked at it, and said, thank you. She tucked it in her bag and never mentioned it again. A few days ago, while cleaning up her study, I found a copy of Dear Kathleen on the shelf next to her desk. I opened it and saw that she had read and annotated it in its entirety, underlining phrases, noting typos, asking various contributors questions in the margins, writing them notes, and in many cases offering her profound thanks. She wrote little assignments to herself to look up writers referenced or to reread her own work in light of 
what had been written. In recent years, she told me that she had been doing a lot of reading, but wouldn't elaborate. I now realized that I had missed a clue of that during that final visit to New York. We had gone to see an exhibition of paintings by Faye Lansner and Barbara Guest. She hungrily, hungrily read the looping letters and words of her late friend's poetry, immediately drawn to the visual play and inventiveness of making large marking, as she herself described it. She is reading both large and small up until the end. Holding that copy of Dear Kathleen, I witnessed the elaboration of that practice, of her close reading and annotating, pencil on the page, a place where her mind could still do its remarkable work. And then in those annotations, she is both teacher and student, writing out definitions of words she doesn't know, questioning the logic of writer's arguments. I love that she left this for us to find, a late, if not final, record of her mind at work. I'm in still in shock knowing that she read deeply all those words written for and about her, that she was able to take in the love and admiration and gratitude that so many of us felt for her. This she experienced as a private act, no longer able to write to us to share her joys, questions, and appreciation for these gifts. This book was a collective thank you to a poet who gave many things to so many of us. And now I get to say Thank you, Kathleen. I'm reminded of a short email she wrote me years ago, showing that she could be succinct as she was elaborative. You see, I was thinking towards you and our project for several hours, and you picked up my brain swerves. And swerve is an off rhyme with love. Okay. <laughs> And now I'd like to invite um, the following people up to line up next to me so we can close this out with a reading of her remarkable wing. If Cole Swenson, Omar Barada, Hazel White, Giovanni Singleton, Robin Trembley McGaugh, Francis Richard, Jennifer Scapitone, Lauren Shuffrin, and Norma Cole could all come up here and line up in that border to my left. Before we start, I'm just going to read um, this brief note that introduces Wing, um, which was published in this beautiful edition, which you can look at at the reception by M. Press and reprinted in her selected poems. Um, but the note is slightly different, so I'm going to read the one from the chapbook. The poem series for Mel Bachner was written in response to his drawings, exhibited December 1988 at the David Nolan Gallery in New York City, and to his 1993 installation, Via Tasso, in Rome at the Museo, Museo Storico de Liberazione di Roma. I am further indebted to Jess, whose paced up wing delivered my point of focus for entering and retrieving certain materials of this poem. It is dedicated to the memory of Joe Brainerd, who died 25th of May 1994, and to his great friend Kenward Elmsley, both of whom entered the poem at various moments of the writing. Part three quote is from St. Augustine. And now we'll read the ten parts of Wayne, with Cole Swenson starting. Wayne. One, the underdrawings. The new comes forward in its edges in order to be itself. Its volume, by necessity, becomes violent and three-dimensional and ordinary. All similar models shaken off and smudged as if memory were an expensive, thick, creamy paper, and every corner turned now in partial erasure. Even bits of pearly rubber, matchstick, and loosened plastic, leaving traces of decision and little tasks performed, as if each dream or occasion of pain had tried to lift itself entirely away, contributing to other corners, planes, and accumulated depth. The wing is not static, but frayed, layered, fettered, furling, and stony. Its feathers cut as if from tissue or stiffened cheesecloth, condensed in preparation for years of stage work attached to its historic tendons. More elaborate, the expansive ribcage, grieving, stressed, yet marked midway along the breastbone, 
with grains of light. There are two men, there are, they are tall men, and they're talking softly among the disintegrating cubes. <laughs> Two, first black quartet, Yatasu. A cube's clean volume shatters and reassembles its daily burnt mark. The new is used and goes backwards into match sticks, one, stu one struck at each day's oxygen, common pinched breath and nerve. The remaining light, bricked up, now melt, with nothing changed yet, he persists, as does pain, have a way of crashing in on you, swimming through matter, heart rate in each cell. There are two men turning, their limit of blanket, that one particular evening appears in red, to unfold in expanding brilliant traces or stars. That which is known to us, or just improvised on deep kitchen floor, meanwhile picking, pecking at our skins, ghost or angel, sent to tell us what we didn't want to know. Three, wing, via van Pitelli. It can happen that the intoxicating wing will draw the mind as a bow. The cubic root of wing falls backwards with light leaking through at the edge. The cube is formally particular and a part of speech and lost. It looks for light kind regardless of function and attempts to replace itself the square root of anything captures and holds, seeming to be final, and we are grateful. We see the delicate marks along the feather, and we follow, now to define or depict the outskirts of meaning. A plume of smoke, or any of the growths which cover the bodies of birds. To form a model of the wing's surface, the cube arrives on a day called the darkest day. Its likeness consists of strength, atonality, pigment, emptiness, and shafts partly hollow. I put my mouth just at the opening where a steel edge gives way to an angle, from which light emerges along its soft, narrow barbs. If the wing had a voice, it would open through a shaft. I am not of that feather. Four, line. Attached by some natural substance, the arm or leg with elbow, or joint midway suggests the next incision or protrusion. It stiffens as a fin or rib projecting new function. It emits signals, periscopic, familiar, helical into the spinal. Wing could loosen that line's identity, calling to itself with charcoal error. Only in contradiction to that which is known to us of nature. Five, color, via della penitenza. Even the new is attached or marked by attachment, the shimmer of wing which claim may tell us everything in a white blink, just as in troubled moments it disappears. A young girl in Arkansas, the quill of an angel in warm light from orange and yellow regions falls, waking touched. An angel stands in technicolor as cosmonauts look out on jetliner wingspan 
attaching itself collectively. These retinal bodies larger, remarkable for their iridescence. Six. Crossroads. He extends thus into plumage as fruit rubbed from walls soaks inward. Your mango human skin doth beckon overlaps against the larger screen. Where floods are night hike, features of body assemble their hawk-eyed distance, abnormally retaining jetliner lure. Yet wanting the same thing always, your innocence dressed in red anterior borders pinion and spur, my teeth which may fit the angel's gear. Having seen thy ancient ground, messenger, angelos, wing. Seven, fall out now and melt with rush all in one place, nothing changed. I did not grow up. I went away in one phase. Brooded I over 